All right, so I'm going to be continuing through my series debunking Calvinism, and we're about halfway through because we made it to the L in their tulip for the five points of Calvinism. And this one is, in my opinion, it's one of the, they're all pretty easy to destroy, but this one is just so, uh, so simple. And I, I you know, for people who, who will consider themselves very scholarly and educated and like to use logic and try to be real smart about things, this is, this is just egregious in their attempt to, to force this doctrine in the Bible. And why do I say that? Well, well, let me just back up a little bit and explain what they mean when they say limited atonement. And this is literally what a Calvinist would believe, is that, that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, did not actually die for the sins of the whole world. So what they believe is that he only atoned or, or died for when, he, when, when the sins were laid on him on the cross, that it was only every person who would believe those sins were on him, but every unbeliever that, that would remain an unbeliever unto death, you know, God in his foreknowledge, any of those people, Jesus did not pay for their sins when he died on the cross. That's, that's the claim made by Calvinists. Now, the way I'm going to approach this is there's many different verses in Scripture that talk about salvation. There's many different passages, and some of them will say, for example, you know, the Bible says that, you know, Jesus Christ shed his blood for the church, right? And, and hey, that statement is true. And if we go back to just thinking logically, right, you have sets and subsets and, you know, groups of people. Well, the Bible can make a statement that says that if Jesus died for the elect or Jesus died for the church. And these are groups of people. These are sections of people that we could say, yes, and this is a true statement. It's absolutely true. But I'm not, so I'm not going to bother myself with looking at all of those passages because we know they're true. They're, you know, Calvinists are going to say they're true, so we're going to be in agreement. But the problem comes in is there's a whole bunch of other verses that broaden that scope of people to be a larger group of people that the Bible specifically says that Jesus died for them that you have to do something with. And this is the total fail of Calvinism in limited atonement. of saying, oh, it's only limited to, to the elect. It's only limited to those who believe. And they'll try to use those other verses to support that. See, look, he died for the church. Or he died for the... But you can't just make your doctrine off of that. You have to look at all of the verses and make sure that everything is reconciled properly. Now, this is, it's really stupid because their answer for every verse that we're going to look up is going to be, well, when it says all, or if it says the world, it's really not all. It's really not the world. It's actually only groups of people. And I spent a little bit of time even just reading up and saying, okay, well, what are you going to say about this? Because some of these verses are just so obvious, just on their face. Okay, they say what they say. It's just kind of like, how could you even think anything else? They just revert back to, well, this is just talking about groups of people. You know, the Bible sometimes will use. Because sometimes the word all could be used to talk about a whole group of people, right? They'll say, well, sometimes all is used to talk about all the nation of Israel. Okay, it, it, it's true. Sometimes in a context it is, it is using that. But you'd still have to say this, though, in regards to, to Jesus' atonement. So then did Jesus die for all of the nation of Israel? See, they don't want to be specific on, well, who are those groups of people then when it uses the word all or when it uses the world, right? It would have to still include unbelievers because I'll tell you what, the, the entire nation of Israel, every single physical person who existed at any given time under the nation of Israel were not all saved. I'm confident in that and being able to say that even without ever having talked to those people that not 100% of you know, every single person who ever lived in Israel, that just, yep, every single one of those was saved. They called on the name of the Lord, and they put their trust in the Lord as their Savior. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Now, some of them did. Many of them did, right? But it's never going to apply to all of them that they were all ever saved. In any large group of people, 
you could say the same thing because we know that that salvation it's not the majority of people it's not most people that are saved it's actually the opposite it's most people are not saved again scripture clearly teaches that but th that's the logic they try to use to say, well, Jesus couldn't have died for everyone. Well, no, he did die for everyone, but it's just not applied to everyone. I mean, that's, and that's the bottom line. It's a real simple doctrine. But let's start off looking at some of these passages that bring up the fact that when Christ died on the cross, he died for everybody because God wanted everybody to be saved. He's, you know, God wants everyone. God wants every human being that was ever born to be saved. But that's not what happens. Some people get saved and some people don't. But the opportunity is still there. The option was still there. The, the, the payment is waiting and ready to be applied to the unbeliever's account. So let's look. I know we just read the entire chapter, but we're going to dig through into Romans 5 a little bit because it's, it's very significant here. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, there are references. They'll, they'll say, oh, yeah, but they end up getting saved later. But when he died, he died for sinners. He died for the people who were not saved. It's clear. I mean, if you're ungodly, right, this is talking about the, the lost. And, and it, as we continue reading here, look at uh, through to verse 8, which I always use out soul winning or, or very regularly use out soul winning. Verse 7 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So this verse, in verse 8, great verse, exalting that great love of God, like just commending God's love of saying, how great is God's love? Hey, there's some people on this earth that, you know what, for a good man, someone might trade their life for them. Someone might actually you know, make a sacrifice for another person to, to, to die for them, right? You might hear that here and there. Most people won't, but you know what? You may find that example. You may find that case where someone would be willing to die for someone else. But God's love is so much greater than anyone else's love that might potentially die for someone else in that while we were yet sinners, even while we sin against God, we transgress against God, we are sinners, we are lost, God still made that sacrifice. The death payment was still made even while we're yet sinners. So right off the bat, we're seeing the concept being formed that God loved us first. That's why we love him. We love him because he first loved us. He loved us how? In unbelief. He loved us as sinners, died, and then gives the opportunity for the sinners to be saved. But it's for all sinners. And we'll get more into the, the all portion because that comes up later. But we see this already being illustrated. That it's, it's not saying anything about, well, God commends his love by dying for the elect. Or dying for this small group of people. No, it's, it's for, for sinners, for the ungodly. Verse 11, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, I'm also going to Romans 5 because, you know, their doctrine is called limited atonement. Well, this is, and, and I don't want to just spend too much time on this, but this is the only time in the New Testament that the word atonement is made. The word atonement is used in the Old Testament quite a bit. But in the New Testament, it's only used here. Now, the concept is still there. The fact that Jesus Christ is reconciling us to God, because a, way, a good way to understand what the word atonement is at one mint. We're making us at one with God. We're make, is bringing reconciliation between the, the, the creature and the creator, right? So, so us as sinners are being reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, and, and that atonement is made. But, and I, I'm not even going into this. You could, if you know enough about the Bible, you know enough about the Old Testament sacrifices, uh, you'll know this is true, or you could look it up later. There were, sin, there were sacrifices made for individuals, right? An individual would bring their sacrifice for sin offering, trespass offering, right? When they do something that they need to get right with God, they'll bring their offering to make an atonement, 
right? Which ultimately our pictures of you know, Jesus Christ replaces all of that as the atonement for us. But there are also sacrifices made in the Old Testament for groups of people, even for all of the people. And if there's people who sin through ignorance, and then if it's like the whole nation, there are offerings made for many, many people to make an atonement with God for whole groups. Even though not everybody in said group was necessarily saved, right, eternally, their soul wasn't saved, but the, but the sacrifice was still made in the name of all of them. And that's true in the Old Testament. Go look it out. So you say, well, how does that apply in the New Testament? Well, it has to apply somehow. All of these Old Testament sacrifices point to Christ as the, you know, he's the fulfillment of all of those. So how does he fulfill those sacrifices? Again, we don't need to get that deep, which is why I didn't even include it in my notes. And I'm just sort of saying it in passing tonight because there's, <laughs> the evidence is so much stronger, just flat out, Bible says what it says clearly without having to look at, well, how would this symbolic reference apply, you know, that, that, is, that is not the strong argument that, that I want to put forward, but it's just another truth that just more support showing that, that this doctrine is, is incorrect, this limited atonement doctrine. Verse 12, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. What's funny is that even within the context of these passages, they have no problem saying, oh, yeah, that all means all there. But then when, when, when you come to all later, it's like, well, but not there. But it means all here, but then not here. It's here, okay, but there it's not okay. And they kind of jump back and forth, even just within the same, like, sentence sometimes. Now, there's another thing that comes in, and see, this limited atonement, it intermingles with original sin, with the, with the uh, total depravity, okay? which I, I'd swap original sin back and forth because that's kind of what, what, uh, what total depravity is all about. But I'll cover that in just a minute because w as soon as we get a little bit deeper in the passage, it, it gets more apparent. So one man, who is that one man that, that brought sin in, in, into the world? Adam, right? That's the one man that's being talked to, death by sin, so death pass upon all men for that all of sin. But this point, I'll make this point right now. Death passed upon all men. See, Adam brought sin into the world, right, and in, in what's being referenced here. But people, every individual is still held accountable for their own sin. We do not die for Adam's sin. When Adam ate of the forbidden fruit, like, it's not like now every single person who's born has that judgment of what he did on their soul. No. No, they don't have to somehow atone for what Adam did, but death passes on all men. Why? why? For that all have sinned. Because everybody then has sinned. Yes, he's passed down a sinful human nature that the flesh will, will drive us to sin, but you still all have your own choices. And that's why babies, those in innocency, don't die and go to hell because it's not like they have someone else's sins to pay for. They don't even have their own before they could even consciously make judgments and decisions and be able to say, no, this is, you know, I'm not going to do that even though I know it's, it's wrong to do or whatever, right? Like the, the age of accountability. I'm not going to get deep into that. That's still under original sin and things like that. But you see how these will already start to intermingle here, these concepts, which is why they have to have their main points to support their doctrine. And I would say this, I was talking to someone earlier after the morning service, you know, all you really need to do is just knock out one of the points in Calvinism because then the rest of it is, gonna, is, is, is by necessity going to have to fall. I've heard of people say they're two-point Calvinists, three-point Calvinists. It's nonsense. They just don't really understand how it all works and fits together because as soon as you knock out one leg, one, one, as soon as you rip one petal off of that tulip, the, the, the rest of the flower wilts, right? It's, 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 it's twice dead anyways. But as soon as you rip off one of those, one of those dead tulip petals, all of it's going to crumble away because it, it can't be supported without all of the other points. They, they, ha they have to be together. 
Otherwise, you start getting into too many contradictions. So um, all, all it takes is one to fall to, to destroy the doctrine. So verse 13, the Bible reads, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. And just further explaining that, even though they didn't sin the same exact way that Adam did, death still reigned, right? They didn't eat of the forbidden fruit, but they had their own sin, right? But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. What The language here might sound a little confusing, but as you just read it, basically it's, it's, What's describing is that the, the, what Jesus did, grace, is the exact opposite of what Adam did with sin. So Adam, one man, brings sin into the world, and then that sin is just bringing forth death unto everyone. Well, equal, likewise, on the other side of the coin, Jesus Christ, one man, brings righteousness into the world and brings grace into the world and, and dies for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, that's going to counteract the effect of that sin brought in by that other one man to overcome the sins of the world. That, that's, in, in a nutshell, what, what this is all saying here is that um, it's the exact opposite. That's why it says not as, like, even though it's, it's just like it, but just like it in the exact opposite way. Does that make sense? Hopefully, yes. Verse 17, for by... One man's offense, death reigned by one. Much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Verse 18, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men, the condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. This is the perfect verse. That's what we're going to say, well, the first time it says all men, that's talking about all men. But the second time it's talking about all men, it's really not talking about all men. It's only talking about the elect. Within the same sentence. Within the same verse. That's stupid. But here's one of the reasons why they fail at understanding this. Well, besides the fact that they're not saved, here's why they can't understand this passage is because they're assuming. Now, now let's read this. Verse 18. By the offense of one man, by the offense of one, excuse me, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Because of what Adam did. Now, that is not stating, we can, we, I could prove this again, going back to the other doctrine with original sin and everything else, you can prove that we are not responsible for Adam's sin. So just because of what Adam did, it doesn't mean that every person is going to die and go to hell because of what Adam did. It even says in this passage that, no, you still have done your own sins. Right, And that's why you deserve death. That's why the judgment would come upon you. It's for your own sin. Adam sinned. He brought the sin nature into the world. But it's still your own sin that you would be paying for. But what Adam did was he made it now much easier and more possible for people to conduct their own sin and then fall into the trap of sin. In the exact same way, on the opposite side, Jesus paid for all men, for all the sins, making it possible for then them to be saved, right? The same way that, that Adam made it possible for everyone to be damned, Christ made it possible for all men to be saved. That is the perfect understanding because it's it, using all men the same way. See, they look at that as saying, well, all men are damned to hell, without Christ because of Adam, which isn't exactly true. Adam brought in the sin nature. 
but then it's still our own individual sin that we choose to do that causes us to be in the condition of, of being dead spiritually. Because again, that all men wouldn't apply unto infants, to the babies, right? But it is using this generic statement of all men, which is extremely broad. And all men, not all sucklings, right? It's, it's, um, but, but all the way in this passage, there's the equal counterpart, right? And that's, that's what we've seen all the way through here. So why would one be different from the other just in this one verse? That makes no sense. Now, now you're trying to force fit a doctrine into a place where it doesn't belong. Verse 19, they do the same exact thing. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now, it uses the same word in both places for the same exact reason to show that it's the counterbalance. It is the offset. It is the equal opposite of the one. So they'll say, oh, yeah, see, but many are made righteous. Not everybody. Okay, but then it says many were made sinners, not everybody, right? I mean, you, you have to apply it both ways. Like, like, you have to be consistent with the way that you apply the language. It, it, it only makes sense. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So, if anything, the scale would be tipped, you know, I was saying everything's like kind of the equal opposite. Grace still overcomes sin that much more. So, where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. Well, how could you even say that if Jesus didn't die for all sins? Because then it would have to only be exactly equal. You see what I mean? Like, like if he only died, it's only the elect, then the grace is only literally covering exactly that much. No, it, it, it abounds more, way more than the sin. God's grace covers that in abundance. And there's so many other illustrations in Scripture that, show, that, that, that illustrate the same truth that, that, you know, there is enough. God always provides enough for everybody. whether or not they choose to partake. Christ, the Christ payment is enough for everybody, but not everyone is going to choose to receive that payment. But, but it's there. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And, and I'll actually just have you turn to all of these places. Because there's not that many, but there's not that many but here, okay, the only thing I have on my notes are just Bible verses. Like, all of these passages are referring to everybody in, in the context. So we're going to look at these all. And these aren't, like, the exhaustive list. So I say that to say, you know, there, there's so many of these. Choose one that you feel is very clearly sufficiently destroying this limited atonement garbage, heresy, saying that Jesus didn't die for everybody, and then all of Calvinism falls. 1 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse number 9. And, and like, in my opinion, like, if this doesn't get you, I, I don't know, it's kind of like, hello, is there anybody there, can you... How many times can you just make excuses for what the Bible actually says before you just accept what it says? Verse number nine, the Bible says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. So that we're actually commanding. Uh, uh, Timothy is being commanded to teach against Calvinism. <laughs> like, these things command and teach, 
okay? What? That God is the Savior of all men? Why would you even single out anybody? Well, especially of those that believe. Those that believe are those that are saved. That would be the elect. That would be, you know, the people who are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. But why are they special? Because he's the Savior of all men, big group, literal all men, all people. But who it's really special for are the people who have gotten saved. Because that's when it becomes actually meaningful. Because the fact that Christ died for everyone doesn't mean anything to the person who hasn't put their faith in Christ. In fact, it does mean something. It means that they're going to have to live with that in death for all of eternity that they had the opportunity and they blew it and they're going to have to go through an eternity of hell knowing hey that that I had my chance God did love me and he loves me no more and again that ver those verses wouldn't even make sense I didn't even cover that one I think in any of my sermons yet that, that he says I will love them no more well, that means God loved someone to a point, and then he stopped loving them. But why would he love anyone who's uh, he's already damned ever? Like, if you're just fitted to destruction and damned, why would I ever love you? In their view of things, right? In their view of things. We understand of going, no, he did, because he loved everybody and wanted everyone to be saved, but through their own choices, they caused God to stop loving them to where he would love them no more. Which... Everybody, every soul burning in hell right now, God doesn't love them. If he did, they wouldn't be burning in a fiery furnace in the heart of the earth. Because you don't do that to people you love. <laughs> I, know, I know this is really deep doctrine here, but... Savior of all men. How else... Can you read that? When, when, when it gives a caveat, especially of those that believe, pointing out, no, and, and especially this group, it, what, especially everybody? Because if you're saying all is only the saved, but it's really special for only the saved. How is that special? It's like the participation trophy. When everybody gets the same award, it's not special anymore. It's not even really an award. Like, you just, what's the point? Everyone gets the same thing anyways. Turn, if you would, to 1 John 2. I, th this is the one place I won't have you turn because I think everyone's got this memorized anyways. John 3, 16. Uh, turn to 1 John chapter 2. John 3, 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth, so that's anyone, right, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The next verse says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. Now, when we're talking about the world there, do we think that that actually means the whole world? Because I do. I, I don't think that that's talking about a group of people. W why would it say that he, did, he wasn't sent in to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved? The world through him. Doesn't mean they, they, they shall be saved, it said they might be saved. Why? Because it's still dependent on them believing in Christ. But the goal, the mission wasn't to condemn the world, but that the whole world might be saved. Now, how could he even accomplish that if he didn't die for everybody? He wanted the whole world to be saved. He came to die for the whole world, but not the whole world doesn't choose him. I mean, over and over again, this is, this is blatantly obvious. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 1, the Bible reads, My little children, these things, have, uh, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. Look at this, colon. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Oh, but that's just some other subset of people. <laughs> the whole world is just the Jews. What? It's just the elect. How do you get that? You have to force the doctrine. 
to just mean something different than what it actually says. God is not the author of confusion. He's not just putting all these verses in the Bible that reference everybody, the whole world, all many different ways of saying it. Hey, this group is special because they believe, but it still is all for everybody. How many times does it have to be there? And I mean, I could just like close the book right now and stop, but there's still so many more that explain this all in various ways about the same concept. It's like God knew that John Calvin was going to live and just be this promoter of this great heresy, so he made sure that the Bible is very clear about this and has it in his word over and over and over again. But no, I don't even think it's directed at John Calvin. It's just because this is the truth, and it's so foundational and fundamental. God didn't want there to be any confusion. And there's enough Bible, there's enough passages to just completely explain this truth so that there should be no confusion. And, you know, the people that want to cause confusion are deceivers. And whether they've been deceived or not, they're still deceivers. Whether they're doing it consciously, knowingly deceiving, or because they've been deceived, it's still a deception to say that Jesus Christ did not pay for the sins of the whole world with any common sense understanding of what the whole world is. Galatians chapter 4. Turn over to Galatians chapter 4. And I've referenced this verse a lot so in 2 Peter 3, while you're turning to Galatians 4, 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Not willing means he doesn't want it. It's not his will that any. Now, now there's, there's another good word, right? Any. Any, does any really mean any? <laughs> or any of his believers. But that's not what it says. It just says any, that any should perish. But that all, all should come to repentance. Galatians chapter 4, look at verse number 3, the Bible says, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. I think this is talking about salvation. Do you not see the same thing? He came to redeem People that we could be called sons of God, that we could be adopted sons of God, right? That's what we're talking about. Well, who did he come to redeem? Those that were under the law. Well, who's under the law? Who's, let me ask you, who's not under the law? The only people that you could say are not under the law would be people who are already saved, right? Because we're not under the law anymore. We're under grace. But he came for those who are uh, ooh, now you got a problem. Because the only people that could be exempted from that group of people are saved people. Everyone's under the law. So, I'm waiting, Calvinist. But <laughs> what do you say to that, huh? You have, to, you have to make up something that doesn't make sense. It, he, he clearly came to redeem those that were under the law because we need a Savior, because the, by the works of the law, no flesh could be saved. Everybody needs a Savior. 1 Timothy tap, chapter 2. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And while you're turning there, you know, I already, I already quoted here 2 Peter 3.9 that, that says that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Likewise, in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5, the Bible says, Who then is Paul and who is Paulus, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Every man has a minister to give them the word of God. 
God has a plan for everybody to hear the gospel that supports the mindset of not wanting people to die. The minister brings the word of God. He sows the seed of God in their heart, but then it's up to them whether or not they're going to choose to put their faith in Christ. Because God's desire would that be that all men would get saved. Because Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I mean, it's all consistent. Doesn't it make sense? For a God of love to, to want everybody to be saved, which, oh yeah, by the way, we actually see reference of that in the scripture, and we actually see that there's a plan for that in the scripture, and we see that God's made ministers for people to be saved, but we also see that not everybody gets saved. But it's not because of God. The people who don't get saved, it's not God's fault. God has done everything that he could for them, which puts the full responsibility on the unsaved themselves. Not God's fault. He did everything that he would do for a person to hear, for the person to have the atonement, for the person to have their sins paid. For, you know, it's all done. Hey, it's, it's done. And, and Christ is a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It is there. It's been ready for people to accept, but it's on you. Their responsibility is on you to choose. Choose you this day. First Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible reads, I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life, in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Wow, imagine that. Another verse that says that God wants, God will have all men to be saved. If he didn't want all men to be saved, then why did Jesus Christ command his disciples to go out and preach the gospel to every creature? Wouldn't it be more efficient to be like, hey, God, can you just give me a list of the elect so I could just go preach the gospel to them? Why should I waste my time giving the gospel to people who just aren't even going to hear anyways? Why would we even need to do that? Why would you say, oh, well, because you know, but, but you, know, you don't know, but I know. Let's keep reading here. Verse number five. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for what? For all. To be testified in due time. God wants all men to be saved. Two verses later, Christ gave himself a ransom for all. Was he a ransom for some? No, a ransom for all. And notice all of these verses that talk about, that use the word whole world, all, it never specifies, well, all the elect or all the, it never does that. That is all inserted by people who prop up a false doctrine. Turn if you go to Titus chapter 2. Real close to 1 Timothy. Just go past 2 Timothy and then Titus chapter 2. Verse number 11, the Bible reads, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. God's grace has appeared to all men. You say, well, you didn't pay for all men. Look, this is consistent with everything else that we've seen. There's a consistency in the scripture. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. How about this? Turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2 verse number 6, the Bible reads, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedst him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thy hands. 
Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put it all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. And notice how it's even still defining there, all in subjection, which means there is nothing left because it really is all put in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. The sacrifice that Jesus made was for every man. It was for the whole world. It was for all. I mean, how many different ways can that even be expressed? I can't really think of any other way. To, if you wanted to express, no, he died for the sins of the whole world. Oh, wait, that's in the Bible. If you wanted to say Jesus paid the, debt, the sin debt for every man, oh, wait, yeah, every man, that's in the Bible. He, I mean, how else would you say it literally is for everybody? I, I, I guess the, what the Calvinist needs to see is that it's for all, and all means everybody, and it's not just one group of people, and it's not just believers, and it literally is every human being who's ever existed on the entire planet. Like, like that's what they would need to see in order to be convinced, because apparently these verses aren't good enough. But God's not going to do that for you. He's already given you this over and over and over again. That is the, the, the result, someone who could just reject all of these verses is someone who's not interested in the truth. They're only interested in their doctrine and not being wrong about it. No, 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 no. I know this to be true. No, you don't. Let the Bible teach you. And you know what? This should apply to any doctrine that we have, any doctrine that we hold to be true. If you start seeing Scripture fly in the face of something that you believe, you better take a second look at what you believe. And, and be humble about it and be willing to be taught by the word of God instead of trying to force a belief into the word of God. Turn if you would to 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to close on 2 Peter chapter 2. And I'll read this passage from Isaiah for you, Isaiah 53. Even in the Old Testament. And again, I was sticking with verses and passages in the New Testament that are explicit in my opinion, just extremely clear. Like, I, 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 I'm failing to see any other way. And when I tried to look for what a Reformed person, what a Calvinist might say against these verses, it was like the same canned answer for everything. Well, when it says all, it doesn't, like, it's just a variation of it doesn't really mean all. It doesn't really mean everybody. It just means a certain group. But it's kind of like, you can't even say that in a good con I, I, I wouldn't be able to say in a good context because it doesn't, you, you don't get that from any of the context. And you may be able to find, and there's a couple passages where I could say, okay, I can see how you could make that conclusion, even though it's a false conclusion, given the context of that passage, but there's just too many here to make that conclusion with. And that's why I start with Romans chapter 5, because it's very clearly doing a comparison and a contrast, and using literally the exact same words to show both sides of the coin, to show the death, to show the life, to show the sin, to show the grace, to show, you know, it's to show Adam, to show Jesus. It, it, it's using that on purpose because they are the, 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 the positive and the negative, the one to the other, the exact equal opposite of the other. But they use the same language. They both use the all. They both use the many. They both, you know, it is, it is terrible understanding it's terrible exegesis of the scripture right about to talk in their language to say that that um, to say otherwise really so I'm reading from Isaiah 53 you're in second Peter chapter 2 Isaiah 53 verse 3 the Bible says he is despised and rejected of men okay his prophecy of Jesus Christ of course right a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Now, we've turned everyone to his own way. Is that everyone? Yeah. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. They've all gone astray, but he's laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, I don't, if they're going to say, well, the us, the our, this is all just only talking about Israel. Because that's the Old Testament, it's Isaiah. Okay, was every member of Israel saved? Every physical human being that was within the nation of Israel that could be considered Israel, were they all saved? No. So if you're going to say that's who the us and the our and the us all, well, you're still having a Savior pay for the sins of people who never get saved. You see what I mean? Which, then why wouldn't it apply to the whole world then when it says the whole world? If you already can make an allowance for it being the all there being this group of people that could include unsaved people. But they again, they're going to say, no, no, it's only the saved. Like every time it's only the saved. If that literally were the truth, God wouldn't be sloppy in his language in all of these places to use words like that that would be so ambiguous and so hard to really get to that truth. That God is not the author of confusion and is not trying to deceive people by using <laughs> hey, this will be funny. I'll put the whole world in there. I'll say that, that the Jesus died for everybody, for every man, for all their sins, that all their iniquities are all laid on him, and, and just see what they do with that. And only these few people, when John Calvin comes along, are going to be able to finally have the key to understanding this. Ah, <laughs> when he said, oh, it's not really all. It's like an insane person. That's what it is. It's insanity when you just, just like, wow, hey, I got it. It's, it's like someone on, on a lot of drugs. <laughs> hey, I, I figured it all out, man. <laughs> and they just say something really stupid like, <laughs> you're a fool. <laughs> hey, I figured it out. When it says the whole world, it's not the whole world. <laughs> when, when it says all, it's not all. <laughs> when he says every man, it's not every man. <laughs> it's amazing. This will blow your mind. Oh, it's stupid. I'm going to take God at his word for what it says. Last reference, and again, it doesn't mean this is the last reference in the Bible. It's the last reference that I decided to put on the paper before I was like, okay, if you can't get this, then I have nothing else for you. Second Peter chapter 2, verse number 1, but there were false prophets also among the people. False prophets, are they saved or not? Okay, we can agree that they're not saved. <laughs> in 2 Peter 2, it's talking about like reprobate false prophets. Okay, just, just want to make sure we understand that. But there are false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Well, that's pretty interesting. They're bringing in heresies. They're bringing in their own destruction. Yet the Lord bought them. Huh. Now, now how else can you descri describe a group of people who are damned and read all of 2 Peter chapter 2? These people are twice dead, plucked up by the... I mean, go through and see all the descriptions of this group of people specifically that it's talking about here. The Bible literally is saying that God bought them. How were they purchased? How were they bought? Well, when we look to Scripture, how was anybody bought? With the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been purchased with the blood of Christ. 
He bought everybody, even the false prophets. But it does them no good. Because their faith isn't in Christ. So they don't have the grace and the forgiveness applied to them. But they belong to God, just like everyone else. And you know what? God's going to throw them in the trash of hell. And he can do that. Because he bought and paid for them. But without that ransom being paid, without that, the, the, it, it, it's of necessity that Christ died for everybody. He had to for things, for, for, for everything to play out the way it does. For God to do what he wants with his purchased possession. Because if they reject that, well, you're, all you're missing out on is a benefit when you reject Christ. All you're missing out on is eternal life. All you're missing out on is forgiveness of sins. All you're missing out on is all the grace, right? There's, there's nothing bad associated with that. But when people still just reject that and God has, God has called and they didn't answer, God has reached forth his hand and they refused, right? Like Proverbs 1 says, hey, I tried, I was there, I was calling out to you, I was there to help you, but you refused. Therefore, you're done, see ya. But he was there, but he did love them, but he did try. But Christ did still die on the cross to pay for the sins of the whole world. So that there could be nothing standing in the way of somebody putting their trust in Jesus Christ because God wants them to. Because Jesus Christ came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Calvinism is really stupid. Okay, Full of, of people professing themselves to be wise, they are really stupid. If you believe a doctrine like this, like I, I'm not sorry, you're stupid. Now, if you are ignorant because you just simply have been duped by someone and you didn't really see all these verses, you didn't see what the Bible says, well, now you know. Don't be stupid and continue in, in error. Don't reject what the Bible clearly says. Just accept it. And, and once this leg falls, like I said, good luck now trying to harmonize the rest of, of Calvinism's doctrines. You can't. They need this to be true in the depth of, of all of the word of God. They need this to be true to try to prop up their false doctrine. Every of the five points you need it to be true. Let's, uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for, for loving the world so much that you would give that ultimate sacrifice in the death of Jesus Christ to pay for the sins of the world, dear Lord. We thank you for loving us so much because that's the only reason why we could even love you. I pray that you would please help us to, to bring the truth and bring your word to people and help them to know that you do love them and you want them to be saved, dear Lord, and that we could be confident in saying that as much as we can be, even though we, we don't know uh, what they'll end up choosing, but we could bring them the good news and, and offer them up that option uh, to put their faith in Christ as you've commanded us to do, dear Lord. And um, we know that our work is not in vain and that um, you, um, you are willing that all would come to repentance. So help us to fulfill that will in uh, equipping us to go out and preach the gospel of every creature. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.